Good morning, good evening, wherever you may be on this quintessential October day. This is Movies, a podcast about the art of cinema. Same. Okay, so try again, release yourself. Oh, release you, you mean? Yeah, fine, release me, just say it. Just fucking say it! Don't you swear at me, you little shit! Don't you ever raise your voice at me! I am your mother! My name is Jake, you might recognize me from quite a few low-res skits. I'm also known as the Cinematologist on YouTube which is in the middle of an overhaul right now. Plenty to come on there. But tonight I'm filling in for Lorez, whose gear I believe has been on the fritz. So while he works on Frankensteining his gear out from the depths of Radio Shack Hell, we're going to talk about Hereditary, a movie that suits October's theme oh so well, in that I had actually recently watched, because I hadn't seen it in the theaters, because I've been kind of on a lull seeing things in theaters the last several months. I've become a little bit of a cynic, and me, personally, I do actually uh, favor going to the local drive-in theater near my house. Um, Yeah, there's actually one about 30 minutes away. We actually have a pretty illustrious uh, drive-in theater that's just just a county or two away. So when I do go out for the movies, I try to go there as much as possible. And that's just like the, the uh, utmost way for me to see movies these days. It's just overall the best experience. You get the most bang for your buck. And then, I mean, who doesn't like driving in and watching a movie in a car where all the noise from people on their phones in the theater and bringing their annoying ass kids and making them sit through a two hour movie with their nil attention spans. Nobody likes that. So... The drive-in has been my go-to, and without going too often this year, only a couple times, I've really just been catching up on movies as they come out on streaming, or most notably Redbox. I, I have an affinity for Redbox that might be criminal. But the non-criminal element to that is that I actually had been super pumped to pick up Hereditary, and it came out onto Redbox uh, quite a while ago. But I had got around to watching it quite recently. And I've got to say, this is one that I'm pretty excited to jump in on for October. And with the theme of the month, and if you're festive like I am with this month, I think you're going to have a lot to enjoy talking about this movie. And maybe me picking your brain a little bit on what you might have thought about it. And so with that said, why don't we get a little cozy, pull up that warm blanket, get a hot cup of cocoa, sink into that love seat, and make sure all the doors and windows are locked. Uh, sorry if this sounds a little bit like a Cosby act, but it's not. And then she lived in our house at the end, before our hospice. We weren't even talking before that. I mean, we were, and then we weren't. And then we were. She's completely manipulative. Until my husband finally enforced a no-contact rule, which lasted until I got pregnant with my daughter. I didn't let her anywhere near me when I had my first, my son, which is why I gave her my daughter, who she immediately stabbed her hooks into. And I just, I felt guilty again, I felt guilty again. When she got sick, not that she was really even my mom at the end, and not that she would ever feel guilty about anything. So this is another one from A24, which they've just become the prodigious distributor of independent cinema for the last five years or so. I know Spring Breakers was one that was big for low res about five years ago. That was one he loved. And they've really built on that kind of indie success with all their approaches to aesthetic and characterization and thematic storytelling. And they usually pick these out of the rough. They're they're not usually produced by A24, but A24 is savvy enough to pick them up and distribute them. So this one, Hereditary, is a continuation of their slew of avant-garde style horror films. You might recognize previous efforts like The Witch or It Comes at Night. Those came out the last two years, and Hereditary came out this year, in June. And to rave reviews, I remember when it came out. I ignored these because, me being kind of the cynic that I am, and having a severe distaste toward the apparatus known as Rotten Tomatoes, I felt I really had to just ignore that noise. I mean, Rotten Tomatoes is a shell of what it was started as. I mean, that's a website that gave Nanette 100% fresh for reviews, and I know Loras has gone off on that quite a bit, so I'm not going to go down that alley. What I'm going to do is talk about this movie, Hereditary. This is one, though, that had a lot of hype because of these critics 
and because of some early buzz about it, and I was weary because I didn't want to be let down the same way I was with It Comes at Night, which I just saw as a very cliched, run-of-the-mill, misleading, dystopian schlock fest. I, I just did not enjoy that movie very much at all. It had some great cinematography, but aside from that, I really just did not get into the story. So Hereditary, I came at a little bit more agnostically, and yeah, I didn't go to the initial release. I wanted to, but it was one of those things I hadn't gotten around to. But lo and behold, the fantastic invention that is the Red Box, one of my favorite things of this era. I was able to get my hands on a copy, watch it at home, and I gotta say, this is one that I really, really loved. I think this one is a rare example of when the movie lives up to the hype that is being bestowed upon it. I don't say this often, I really don't. But there really was something different about this movie that I think a lot of people did cling on to to their credit and even to the credit of the critics. I guess they did get this one right. But there's a lot of things that people don't mention about modern horror films. And I think we're actually in a pretty decent time for horror films overall. The big picture, I think, looks good. I think producers and directors are starting to tap into some more creative sensibilities that really weren't ironed out maybe in, in the aughts and in the early 2010s, if you will, of this decade. I think the smaller, more personal style films are actually doing quite well. And some of the Conjuring films I do like. I think James Wan does a great job in a lot of his films, but not this way. Uh, this one is different because I think there's just such autonomy here on part of the director, Ari Aster. And I think he really has an understanding for the mechanics that make the classic horror film work. And he brought those to today. And there's quite a few examples of that that I'd love to illustrate one by one, that a lot of the modern horror films and just films in general don't seem to capture. And I think it's because we're a victim of the times in terms of cinema and in terms of very low attention spans, but Hereditary taps into the most formative things that make horror films scary. And it presents it in a very compelling way with a surprising mix of psychological and supernatural horror that I think is gonna win over many generations to come. And I don't take this lightly when I say that I think this is an instant classic. Now it's up for debate with a lot of the films of recent years, even things like The Witch or It Comes at Night. But with this one, I think it's as clear as can be. There was one specific blurb from a critic that had said, this was this generation's version of The Exorcist. I'd like to think that's true in a lot of senses. It didn't send people running out of the theater scared, but again, it's not 1973. We're in a much more desensitized culture. So I think to even get that compliment is almost good enough and almost as good as sending people running out of the theaters screaming in terror. Don't know if that's gonna happen anytime soon, but this might be as close as you get. So there's a lot to unpack with this movie, and I'm not going to get into spoilers because that is just going to ruin it for anybody listening to this, but I will make allusions to plot points and character trajectories and whatnot. So I just want to be courteous to everybody here and really give this a fair hearing while not ruining the experience of the movie, because you can already tell by my praise of it, I think you should watch it. So why don't we just get into a little bit of the nitty gritty for the next 20 minutes or so and really delve into why this movie works and why it is an instant classic. So the plot is quite simple. The mother of our main character, Annie, passes away at quite an old age. She was ridden with some dementia-laden disease and it is kind of a somber transition in adulthood for Annie but one that she's been ready to face, and it really shows that her and her mother really haven't had the greatest relationship at all in the last several years. And Annie is played by Toni Collette, who is an Australian actress, who does a magnificent job, and I guess we'll touch on that in a few moments, but Annie is 
plagued by this death in the family as it now seems to knock over a bunch of dominoes that she had no idea were even in place. And starting with the death of her mother, a whole series of events spirals out of control into what becomes a chaotic foray into the inner demons of this family and finding out who they really are. And that's, that's the compelling nature of this story. They, that, that's the story underneath all of the scariness and all of the uh, excitement of the movie is something about a very damaged family in so many different ways. And that's kind of the psychological aspect that chips away. And this isn't even to sound pretentious. This is just to really kind of get down into the nitty gritty of the story because there's plenty out there that, that can scare the crap out of you with this movie. Who's this? It's Grandma. You know you were her favorite, right? Even when you were a little baby, she wouldn't let me feed you because she needed to feed you. You're crazy. What's so effective about this movie is that it gives you that cerebral feeling even after you're done watching it. And this doesn't happen often with me, but this was definitely an instance where I watched the movie and then afterward, when I get up at 4.30 in the morning like I usually do, like the psychopath that I am, I'll be shuffling around in my place and just that kind of cerebral fear kicks in where this empty apartment or this empty house in which I'm in just becomes a lot more foreboding after watching a movie like Hereditary. And that's from a combination of things. You see, the thing with horror movies today is that, for example, the 2017 version of It was extraordinarily successful. And I think that was because it was generally faithful to the source material and it captured the essence of the characters quite well and effectively. And, and I praise it for that as well. But when it comes to the horror aspect, there was much less a psychological strain in that movie, a movie that I think has approached about a billion dollars in the box office, in contrast to something like Hereditary, where the whole angle is to just have that slow burning kind of horror in you that builds gradually throughout the movie until it hits a fantastic crescendo. But then there's going to be uh, an after effect of that when you're walking around the house at night alone, when those kinds of subconscious fears that are tapped into in the movie are relayed upon your own subconscious. And that's when I find movies, especially horror movies, obviously, much more gratifying and rewarding in that sense that after the experience is over you can still be affected by this movie and that's happened to me with a few movies but it's it's always tapped into that real basic childhood sense of fear in which you're just isolated in which there's always this foreboding presence of of danger around you and that's what hereditary provides and again, kudos are due where this is one that was seriously hyped up by the critics, by the festival circuit, because I remember this one was doing extraordinarily well in, I believe, the, the con outlets and South by Southwest. I think it might have made runs around there. I could be incorrect on that. But I remember hearing the buzz on this after a couple initial premieres in the beginning of 2018, uh, around January, I believe. It premiered at a couple of festivals and it had some amazing buzz. And I mean, that definitely rings true because there's just so much here that you can unpack in terms of the story elements and in terms of what kind of horror just happens. And like with a lot of great movies from years past, this one is interesting in that it has a story that's quite simple but unsettling. And that being that the familial connections that haunt us even after our family members passing, that's very relatable to many of us that have had to deal with death in one way or another. And another thing that it touches on is that these kinds of events can burden our children to conflicts and confusion that then circle back to our own inner demons or what conflicts we might have had with our recently deceased relatives. And that's definitely present here with the Charlie and Peter characters from the film. Uh, Charlie being the young girl with uh, quite the peculiar look to her. She's a Broadway actress that 
This is her first big movie. I think she's about 16. And the Peter character is played by a Nickelodeon veteran who's actually been in quite a few things lately. He was in the Jumanji reboot, if you will, or Jumanji sequel. And both of them surprisingly put forth quite effective performances. And that's, again, a credit to this film because it treats its characters very realistically. They talk like kids. They act like adolescent kids. And they have a kind of realistic, I think, uh, standoff with their mother in terms of where they've always felt they were in place of all the relationships and and what conflicts they had with their mother in general. There's actually a couple of shocking moments that touch into that kind of stuff. And again, this is how our own inner demons can kind of fester inside of us until we release that unholy fury, uh, just completely red-eyed. And that happens at quite a couple moments in this film. And again, kind of to tap into the slow burner aspect. This isn't one that necessarily stomps on the gas pedal right away, but there are some shocking moments in this, and I really say that with some remnants of surprise, because you you feel by, by 2018, there's a lot of things that aren't commonly done in these kinds of films, or they're more suggested, and this film is suggestive in a lot of correct ways, but it's also gutsy in a couple of the chances that it takes. Now, I think We've seen almost everything in cinema, especially with horror cinema, and we've seen a lot of unforgiving styles of stories and uh, plot points that directors and filmmakers have taken. But I feel with the recent years, and maybe with the turn of, I don't know, maybe the 21st century, there's been a dialing back of a lot of things, and maybe to cave into corporate pressure and to really hone in on demographics and not to ruffle any audience feathers, but that's never going to appeal to audiences or resonate with audiences the same way that some of our most cherished classics have taken risks that were seen as very unconventional, like even Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho killing off the main actress in the first act. So there's a couple of those moments here, and they definitely resonate very chillingly, at least with me. But I appreciate a film that goes all the way with its premise and doesn't seem to follow typical conventions. It's not to say that this one doesn't follow any conventions, but just how it stands out from the normal archetype of a horror film is very reminiscent of what A24 horror films have been becoming known for. And especially within the context of this particular film individually, it really does deliver on those uh, those points. But what I think we really need to pay attention to here is the overall aesthetic approach. That's something that I harp on very much so when talking about films and analyzing films. And it's something here that I think is paramount to the film's success. And I'll tell you why over the next 12 minutes or so. So in horror films, I am of the belief that corporate studio-laden horror films that don't really have a sense of how to scare people and have a sense of how filmmaking can still effectively scare people using the most classical of techniques, fall victim to the same pitfalls again and again. And what we're seeing today, and I would even accuse quite a few Blumhouse pictures of this, is that we're seeing a lot of very contemporary horror films that just pay, just pay service to people that really can't keep their attention going for more than a few seconds with all the distractions we have today. I think we're seeing a lot of cuts, we're seeing a lot of stings and high-pitched noises to scary images or something like that. Jump scares, obviously, as I'm circling back to that topic. But that's really what's going on here. We're, We're not being immersed in horror films or in the setting of horror films as we used to be. And I don't even think that's a nostalgic point of view. I think that all comes down to techniques in cinematography, techniques in editing. And one critique I would have for a lot of horror movies today is that they don't let the scene breathe. And one great instance of that, I'm going to circle back to it of 2017, is when Georgie is reaching into the sewer and Pennywise is gaping his mouth open with a bunch of teeth and right before he's going to sink into his arm. 
And I just felt that if they just let that play out another half second or another second and just get the totality of that buildup, that would have much more effectively captured the terror of the scene. And I think it's just because studios and maybe even some modern directors don't think people like slow burners. They like clear cut, completely beat out, uh, beat by beat horror films that just get you from A to B. And I don't think that is the experience of a horror film. Go back to any of the most formative classics of the last 40 or 50 years and you're going to see a consistent pattern in how they were shot, edited, and what techniques they had aesthetically to really strain the audience's sense of security. And my point is that Hereditary does that here to the fullest extent. A lot of scenes are allowed to breathe and a lot of scenes are staged in brilliant one takes and with a lot of uh, well-planned choreography or blocking on part of the actors and the director Ari Aster. And I think Ari Aster was uh, very savvy in that he just let things unfold in front of the screen for quite a while. And there's a lot of keynote scenes I want to mention in particular, but I'm not going to for the sake of you guys that might not have seen this movie. But I will say the effective scenes for me, and especially uh, quite a few, were when certain characters were in an environment that called for a lot of dramatic tension. The kind of dramatic tension that is foundational in horror films. And them just tiptoeing through these kinds of settings with no idea what's on quote unquote the other side of the door and us knowing and being clued in on that dramatic tension but seeing that unfold in singular takes and seeing the progression of the actor's emotion and just being immersed in these environments with these characters that is what gets you invested and what gets you completely uh, involved in this movie or in these kinds of movies and I think that's something that's been terrifyingly <laughs> to make the pun uh, lacking in a lot of recent horror films and to see Hereditary pick up on that and particularly to my own sensibilities really cater to that was something that I just was so into and it just got me so invested and it really stretched out the suspense quite a bit more and I've just got to say, to add on to the point of movies going all the way with their premise, this one again turns up the crazy slowly but surely, but when it hits that peak of just craziness, there's no turning back. It is just a harrowing, disturbing, immensely fun but terrifying film. And it really picks up, I want to say, after the first act. There's quite a turning point in late in the first act, and it just changes the whole dynamic of the movie. And that's what's good about it, because from that moment on, it builds up in a direction you don't know necessarily where it's going to go. You don't know if it's going to go completely down one plot line, down another, if it's going to tap into one character quality or another. But I do have to say that I was surprised in the direction that the film took, because I thought I had it figured out just by watching the trailers and by getting into the movie in the first act. I thought I knew where the story was going to go, what it was going to highlight, and I won't, again, spoil what my theory was and how it was wrong, but I would like to say that this film doesn't aim to be too pretentious, and that is one of the things I love the most about it. It's definitely suggestive, and it definitely, and it definitely wants the viewer to pay attention to a lot of the aspects, but at no point in this film did I feel that it was talking down to its audience or that it was trying to be some higher form of art. I, I just think it's masterfully done, but I think it's done with noble intentions. I think it's done genuinely, and I think it's done with real passion behind it because there is just a progression to this film that kind of gives you a misdirection. And when it takes you down the path that it's going down, your reaction, or at least mine was, oh, they're going this way with it. That's interesting, I didn't see that coming. But then when they blend multiple styles together and bring together a product that meshes a couple different qualities that have been popular in contemporary horror cinema, 
it really creates an interesting combination that turns out to deliver just an immense payoff. And again, I don't want to make this up like I'm hyping up the movie too much, even though I am. But I think that speaks to the quality of the film because this is one that, again, I was skeptical of the acclaim and of the word going around about it. And I just think with the quality of the performances, especially by Toni Collette, you see, this is one of the most compelling female performances in the last few years in film. It's a very realistic character, a very flawed character, and it's it's not painting this heroic uh saint-like person. It's painting a real person with real problems. And I, and I just like how Toni Collette captured that. It, it was so convincing. And her own horror in the, in the film was very convincing in that as well, it, that we were experiencing it vicariously to her. And the changes in emotion she has, the changes in facial expressions she has, and just some of the stuff she has to put herself through physically in this film is just incredibly impressive and definitely on par with the rest of the performances. I mean, the whole movie is wonderfully acted. The child actors do, or child-like actors, they're actually quite a bit older than their characters are supposed to be, actually do a great job. The only funny thing to me was the husband character, who he was just kind of there. He seemed like he was kind of a support system, but he didn't really... I don't know, he didn't really assert himself too much besides one point. But then after that, he's he's just kind of pedestrian. It's not that the actors did a bad job. It's that I think that was the balance in the script that Astor was looking for, that there's this one character that is just kind of stationary and static. Because the other characters, admittedly, are quite dynamic. And that's that's a testament to how much is going on in this movie, but not too much that you get disoriented. Each of the characters has their own storyline and they go through their own kinds of challenges and each one is just as terrifying as the next. And then there's just other things in the film that really just help it stand out and really give it an identity. The kinds of, for example, the playing with the small models, that's uh, Tony Collette's character's job in the movie, she, she creates small models for presentations and everything. There's another cerebral aspect to that in which they frame these fake environments, but it's also very reminiscent of what's going on in the story. And that's something that can definitely tap into some subtle symbolism because it's right there. So it's stuff like that. But then in combination with everything else it has going for it, it just becomes a much more mesmerizing film in that aspect and even that much more unsettling with with the just lifeless figures that are planted in the doorways of these fake little houses it's stuff like that that can even creep into your subconscious and give you give you some creepy feelings when you're walking through the house in the dead of night alone Uh, in terms of critiques of this film that's really an interesting question because I, i really see this film as almost perfect i mean if you had to give me a rating to give it, I'd say a 9 out of 10, honestly. Um, it's just, again, no or very few films are even close to perfect. But with this film, I just think it understood film language quite well enough. And it really didn't kind of advertise itself as a horror movie and come off as faux anti-horror, which you go on Reddit and you'll see plenty of people complaining about films of the past or a couple of years that really haven't lived up to their marketing as an all-out horror film. And I think this does not mince words at all. I think it is a terrifying movie in the best way possible. But I suppose if I have to give it a critique, I suppose the length is up for debate. It's about two hours and ten minutes, but I don't see that as a real hindrance to the movie. It's a little bit deeper of a film than that. But again, not overly pretentious. It's I think anybody can enjoy it as long as you sit down and get into it. But it's definitely one that you'll want to check out this October if you haven't already and you want to go on a long horror movie marathon. I, I mean, I, I couldn't give this movie any higher praise. It's, uh, I, I hate to make these kind of statements, but it is one of the best horror films I've seen in the last several years. And I know that's something that is definitely not a knee-jerk reaction on my part because usually when these things come around, I try to be 
a little more even tempered about them and, and try to analyze them a little bit after the fact. So at the end of the day, I just think Hereditary is, again, one of the best horror films of this generation. It, it doesn't pull any punches. That's the best thing about it. It goes all the way with its premise. You may not like the direction it takes necessarily, but I would say to give it a chance because though I didn't expect it, it just, it bugged the hell out of me like on a visceral level. And I mean that in the best way possible. The imagery, it can just be horrifying at times. The camera work, the editing is masterfully allowed to breathe and allowed to let the actors flourish in their settings. And that's where the actors such as Tony Collette really just hit a home run with their performances. Again, I'll say, I do believe Tony Collette d deserves an Oscar nomination for this, if not an Oscar. But if you even give a crap about the awards, which most of us don't, I think, listening to this podcast, um, if you don't, then yeah. But for the sentiment of it, I think she does deserve some recognition for this. And I think this this is a horror film, yeah, that is kind of on par with the Exorcists and the Rosemary's Babies of the past that have gained that kind of Academy attention. Though I think horror films are just completely shunned uh, unreasonably, largely. And it's just because they don't play to the right ideology. They don't play the right politics. And the ones that do, uh, they, they just make the cut or they squeeze through pretending to be something else. But this is one that really stands out. This is a true product of a real filmmaker who has actual passion behind his films. And I'm, I'm glad to see Ari Aster has really broken through with his first feature like this. And I'm more than interested to see how this holds up and how this ages with time. Because I think this could be the defining horror movie of this generation or of this decade perhaps or of the late 2010s but i guess i'm going to stop it there for now i just hope you guys have enjoyed me subbing in for low res and you can follow me via low res's channel on youtube because i'm there but if you want to jump over to me at the cinematologist i think low res has got me linked up on his channel there uh, it's in the middle of a overhaul right now i have some stuff that should be coming out in October that I'm working quite a bit on. So if you just give me some leeway, I'm going to have some really good stuff there. But this was cool. I hope to jump back on here again. And I wish I was a little bit funnier for you guys, but I kind of did this on the fly. So uh, I just had to talk about the movie. And there was so much I wanted to say about the movie and that I couldn't because I want you guys to enjoy it as well. Um, that I suppose the comedy is going to have to suffer this time. But again, guys, thanks for tuning in. This is Movies, a podcast about the art of cinema. I'm Jake, the cinematologist. And for those of you that celebrate October the same as I, enjoy the rest of the month. Be sure to binge as many horror movies in the month of October as humanly possible. Make sure you keep the windows shut, the doors locked, and the lights turned out. And most importantly, everybody, have a happy, safe, and healthy October. October.